Well, what a wonderful day, and I look forward to ministering the word of the Lord to you this morning. Uh, we are continuing in our series, Moving Beyond the Natural, and I am excited to preach uh, from Mark chapter 5 today. This will be the third sermon out of Mark chapter 5, so it's a part three, Jesus Knows and Jesus Helps. We're on a faith journey. That's what moving beyond the natural means, means we're on a faith journey. So I'm going to read this morning our passage from Mark chapter 5, verse 21 to 43. Would you stand this morning as I read this passage in this series? Mark 5, 21 to 43. Jesus got into the boat again. And went back to the other side of the lake, where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local, local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she, got, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look. At this crowd pressing around you, how can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jarius, the leader of the synagogue, and they told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jarius, don't be afraid, just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying holding her hand he said to her Talithia come which means little girl get up and the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around they were overwhelmed and totally amazed and Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened and then he told them to give her something to eat father the miracles of Christ are for us today. Cause faith to arise in this place. Cause faith to take action in this place. Cause the world to know our God is a miracle working God. And do it through us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. There are two stories woven together today. Two stories woven in one. And what's the significance then? And what's the significance now? We're going to walk through these stories and see how it relates to us now. Now Mark tells us in the two stories that there's miracles in the midst of chaos. This is yet another theme that we keep seeing. It's showing up in the book of Mark. I told you Mark is such a power-packed book. And it's another story in Mark 4. Pastor Rob preached about peace and chaos. Our lives are always rife with chaos. But in the midst of chaos, which is a part of the natural, it causes us to begin to see the supernatural. At least it causes us to seek the supernatural. 
Sometimes when chaos happens, it's not for us to fall apart. It's for us to step to the next level of God's greatness because God wants to show us what he will do in the midst of our situation. Many times as Christians, the minute something goes off, that seems a little unnatural. Instead of stepping up and going, God, you've got this. We fall, I don't know what I'm going to do. And we don't prove God holy by falling apart. We prove God holy by stepping in the midst of the chaos and say, but God's in control. Amen? How you behave when things happen shows the level of your faith, whether you believe in the impossible God or not. And so I want to encourage you, whatever is going on, don't give the enemy credit and don't give the enemy credence, but instead give God all the glory and allow God to show his wonder through your life. Three things I want to share today. And I begin with this one, a pleading parent, a pleading parent. The story shows a ruler's desperate approach to Christ. Being a ruler, Jarius means that, being a ruler that Jarius was, it means that he had status, he had money, he had notoriety, he had material stuff, he had everything that the world calls successful. And the ruler, the Bible tells us, he approached Christ. When he came to Christ, he came as a selfless, humble, pleading man with an attitude that said, God, I'm abandoned. See, the problem when people have status and notoriety and fame is that there's no humility left in them. And the attitude sometimes for many changes because they no longer remember that they need God. They think, all I need is what I've got. Jarius was a very important man. He was a synagogue ruler. And in his community, Matthew 9 tells us that in that community, these these synagogue rulers, they despised Jesus. They could not stand Jesus. So Jarius coming to Jesus means that he had to take a stand against his own society, his own community. Friends, we don't allow the world to shape what we believe and who we are. We shape the world by what we believe and by who we are. We are. Are you with me this morning? And it's very important we get this in our spirit because our world is changing everything and causing us to feel that we don't have a right to believe what we believe, to speak what we speak, to say what we say, that we should throw our Bible out or give it to them to interpret to us and give it back to us. We stand on the word of God and that's what we have to hold for, for, um, hold, hold for in the forefront today. So Jarius, he checked in his pride and his status, and he came with a desperation. His desperation was like this, God, I've done all I can, but now I need your help to restore my child from death to life. Because you see, when his child died, his money couldn't bring her back. His fame couldn't bring her back. His status couldn't bring her back. His community synagogue leaders couldn't bring her back. He could not do anything but come to the only one that could help him in his time of need. That is why miracles must happen in the church so that they know where to come. When all else is done, God is still at work and he begins right here with us. Can I hear an amen this morning? See, Jesus pays attention to the right attitude. And the right attitude must be humility, selflessness, and faith. There are many times that people want to come and they want a miracle, but no humility, no selflessness, and no faith. I just want what God can give me. Well, God is not a jack in a box. He is the almighty God. When we come, we must come humbly, we must come selflessly, and we must come with a faith that says, you are God alone from before time began. Oh, glory to God this morning. So here in the book of Mark again, we're seeing something. In the story just before this that we preach, the last one I preach, you saw a desperate, poor, demoniac man. Do you remember the demoniac man with legions? He was desperate, he was poor, he was in need. Now, in later in Mark, after Jesus crosses the water again, we're now finding a desperate, wealthy intellectual. You see what Jesus is showing us this morning? 
Whether you're a poor, desperate demoniac or you are a wealthy status, uh, 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 influential leader, you still need Jesus. Oh, glory to God, somebody. Sometimes we relegate, oh, this poor man needs Jesus, but this rich man doesn't. Rich or poor alike, the Lord is the maker of them all. Jarius could have sent his servants to speak to Jesus, but he determined that it wasn't society's job to raise his child up. It was his. Are you hearing me? He was a, a synagogue ruler. He could have sent anyone, but he was determined, I cannot send for, to someone to do the job of a parent. This was a desperate parent that says, God, this one, I am taking to Jesus myself. I want you to understand me, parent. There are some things that you can, must stop relegating to the school system and to the government, and you need to come and get on your face and ask Almighty God to break some things, change some things, and turn some things around. We are so in a day now where it's like the government's this and the goodness and the school system it's all broken it's all it's all broken it's all secular but the house of God still has power in it power to heal power to deliver power to save I'm going to put a plug in here. Throughout the summer, we're having prayer meeting every Tuesday night. Some of you parents need to come and war before the Lord and bring those situations to God rather than sit back on, I can't do anything. It's millennials. It's their attitude. It's who they are. It's what they Ah, oh, come on. Do you know what made us who we are? We had some grandmothers who would go to the throne of grace and fix it for us. Fix it for us. We need to get back to that place. And I'm put in a serious plug now because it's prayer that's going to change everything. Today, debauchery is happening all over our city. We have no controls. And there's people who will not come out to pray because you're too, your status is too high. Your job is too important. I can't stay out late, but every other night you can stay out late. I want you to know it's prayer that's going to make the difference. And that's what counts. Every Tuesday we're here for prayer except on the long weekends, July, August, and September 1st weekends. Every other Tuesday we're here. That's just a plug. I have to say it because prayer is what's going to cause this generation of young people to fear God and to keep him holy. I, 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 I'm, I'm off, but I shared on Tuesday night when two boys will show up in the middle of millions of people and still come with their guns. They don't fear man. They don't fear the law and they don't fear God. And when there's no fear of man, no fear of the law and no fear of God, that church had better have fear in their hearts and begin to ask God to change something in society because they've gone mad. Is anybody with me this morning? Oh, glory to God. So here's De Jairus. Jairus, influential man, but he figured nobody can restore my child. And the Bible says that seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet. You see, he had to put aside his pride and his dignity. He had to put aside what his family was thinking. He had to put aside what his professional peers were thinking. He had to put aside his status and his behavior that would show himself big and he had to humble himself and get on his face before Jesus. Seeing Jesus he fell at his feet. When you approach God with such humility he pays attention to your cry. He approached with a believing attitude and when he approached Jesus, can you imagine? See synagogue rulers were known right? They wore the garb they were known in their community and here's Jesus. What was the last thing Jesus did? He had cast out demons and they went into a pig and that society kicked him out. In those days, word traveled just as fast on the news. It traveled by mouth. We still seem to have that today. But the, 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 the word would have gotten out. This is the same Jesus. Synagogue ruler. The Bible says he comes out. There's a 
a great crowd and seeing Jesus, seeing Jesus, seeing Jesus, he's like, you know what? My child is emotionally dead. My child is physically dead. My child is spiritually dead. Whichever dead your child is dead. Seeing Jesus, he went up to him and he's like, synagogue club, you stay behind. I need a miracle right now. And he got on his knees. He fell. When he fell on his knees, you know what that means? It wasn't even cute. You don't fall cute. When he fell on his knees, it means he came in and just threw himself at Jesus' feet. So guess what happens right in that moment? Just freeze frame that scene. The crowd's going, oh, that's a synagogue ruler. Like, oh, how can this happen? I can just imagine all that's going in their mind. And while this is happening, in the midst of this scene comes a woman. And this woman obviously observes the faith of a synagogue ruler who has just put his status on hold, who has humbled himself before Christ, who is desperate for a miracle. So this woman is standing in the back of the crowd, and she's going, the synagogue ruler is desperate for a miracle, and he believes Jesus can do it. Well, now, if he's desperate, I'm desperate. See, I, I was desperate before he was desperate, but now that he's that desperate, I'm really desperate. And the Bible says this desperate woman, she just figured in her spirit, why shouldn't I ask for help? To Why shouldn't I get not ask? Why shouldn't I get help? But she knew she had no right to come up to Jesus because of what society had dictated. She, she had been told, you can't come close to them. You're, you're going through this bleeding, and, and, and there were rules and laws who she could touch and who she couldn't touch. But when she saw the synagogue ruler, a significant man who had just fallen before Jesus, he's like, oh, if you're going to have so much faith to get your daughter raised up, I need me a miracle too. And the Bible says she reached out and she took Jesus' cloak. I'm going to tell you something. Whether you're at the top or at the bottom, it doesn't matter. What matters is how much faith do you have for what you want to see God do today. She saw, she saw a desperate man. She was extremely lonely in her world of sickness. Because sometimes when you're sick long term, you are forgotten. You know what I'm talking about? Friends, I want to remind us in the church, as pastors, we can't get to everybody. Would you as a body of believers remember the shut-ins? We can't, if we are to do everything that everybody wants, it means we would never sleep. But don't forget those with long-term illnesses. They're forgotten after a while because it's going on for so long. I think of our Veronica Brithwaite and others such as that. Don't forget them. She was extremely lonely. Nobody understood her anymore. When you're constantly sick, people stop understanding you because we're in a day where we want everything to be better right away. Why isn't she better now? I'm tired of hearing that. Get over it. And, and, and there are times some people love their sickness. And, and if you're one that loves your sickness, please, please touch Jesus. Just let it go. You know, there are people who do, they do. They love being sick because if they weren't sick, they would have nothing to complain about. There are some people who they have to use their, their, their trauma to make sure that they get attention. You know, the, the people, some people hold, talk to me, church. Do you know some people will hold on to trauma because if they, don't, if they got rid of the drama, they would have no attention. Uh, can I just encourage you, let it go in Jesus' name. Let it go. Be healed. Be delivered. Be set free. That's what makes you strong. And then you'll find a new level where you will have much attention because people who want to be set free will come to you because they'll be, how did you get free from what you've been going through? So just this woman was desperate. She had only seen the negative things of life. And socially, she couldn't touch people. Physically, she was drained because blood was leaving her every day. Materially, she had spent everything. She had no money. Emotionally, she must have felt so insecure, so, so destroyed in her spirit. Spiritually, she had no communion, no, co no communion with people, no communion with God because she always had to be by herself. So this woman, on her own accord, she's thinking, at this point, I don't care what anybody thinks of me. If the synagogue ruler is going to throw himself 
myself on Jesus. I don't have the right to come in front of Jesus, but even from the back, I'm going to take a miracle today. Oh, glory to God. Can I tell you something? Got to get some desperation in your spirit. God, I don't care what others think of me. I need a miracle, and a miracle is what I'm going to have. The religious leaders, the crowd, they were stirred. The disciples were offended. People would have been upset. Others would have been appalled. Who touched me? Jesus said. Because she came up with hope and put her hope to action. Do you know what? You can touch Jesus when you put your hope to action. When Jesus found out who it was, he said, Daughter, your faith has healed you. And then he says these words, go in peace. Be freed from your suffering. Your faith makes the difference. Church, what happened to our faith? Speak to me today. What happened to our faith? How can we be a church without faith? See, the churches without faith are becoming condos because you can't stay open without faith. We're on a faith journey. We're faith people. We've got to believe God for the impossible. We've got to believe God for the miraculous. We've got to believe God that the world will see why we believe God. I'm not bored coming to church. I'm not bored with my life in Christ because I've seen God do miracles time and time and time again. If you are bored, it's because your faith is not in action. When your faith is in action, you begin to feel excited because you wake up every morning, oh, God, I can't believe you did that. I can't I can't believe you moved that mountain. I can't believe that you separated that pathway. Can I tell you if you're bored with your faith, it's because your hope is not put in action. Your faith is not put in action. But a world out there, they're grappling, trying to do everything to feel good. But after the season of, of, of great exploits and after they paid it all, they need something else to keep them happy. But I'll tell you, when you are in love with Jesus and when you begin to walk in the realm of the miracle, you can't wait for the new day to see what's God doing today. If you're in a nominal Christianity, something is wrong because you're not touching Jesus. It's time to strip off the pride, humble yourself, and fall back to God. Give me a miracle here because it's going to set me on fire. Oh, glory be to God today. Daughter, your faith has made you well. The voice of assurance came from Abba, the peace. And here's the thing, my friends. There are people who are afraid to say, do you know there are people who will be very sick and don't even want to tell the church they're sick because they don't want people to know their business? I, I, I'm going to touch it today. I'm going to touch it. I'm, I'm going to go there. Now, see, there's... Two ways of dealing with this. I don't want nobody to know my business. Well, don't tell me the details. But if you can't say I'm sick, then your pride is what's keeping you sicker. Because it takes humility to go and throw yourself before Jesus. And then there are those who, I'm sick, and when I get better, I'll let you know. Why? Because then you want to come and say, see, I'm so powerful, I'm all good now. But see, that doesn't prove God holy. Uh, there are people who want a miracle, but they don't want anybody to know they need a miracle. So how can it be a miracle? Because when God has done the miracle for you, you can't tell anybody because you never told anybody you needed a miracle. You see, we, 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 it's not that God has stopped doing miracles in the church. It's that we have stopped giving glory to God. God. We've stopped demonstrating the power of God. So we're like, I don't see any miracles. There's miracles every day, but people are not declaring A in thanksgiving and B in petition. I need a miracle. If I told people that I need a miracle in finance, they're going to go, I thought he was wealthy. Well, you know what? You can be the billionaire and just even the stock market changes and things change. You can own a company and it's going wonderfully well and then 
things change. I remember a friend of mine owned a printing company and they were sailing. They were doing super fantastic with their printing company. Almost opened the second one. And then guess what? The technology age came and people just stopped printing like this and it just started going down. What changed? Does it make them any less a person? No. Economy changes, culture changes, seasons change, things change. You get back and go, God, give me a new idea. But when we don't want to give glory to God, we sit there and we die in what God gave us in the first place because we refuse to testify of the goodness of God. But here's the part I want to share in this. It's so good. When the woman touched Jesus, when virtue left Jesus, And Jesus turned around and she grabbed her miracle. He said, go in peace. Later on in another passage in the New Testament, I just blanked if it was Luke or Marcus. Later on in Luke, that same woman shows up because people began to do exactly what she did. They began to touch Jesus. The hem. It says where, I think it's in Mark 9, wherever Jesus went, people touched the hem of his garment. Why? Because some woman went, I can't go where the synagogue ruler. See, do you, do you remember the scene? Synagogue ruler is lying on the floor in front of Jesus. The woman's like, I can't go there because A, they will pick me up and throw me out. I'm like diseased. I'm desperate. I'm poor. And there's a great ruler there desperate. So I can't go beside that. I'll just come right behind and just seize a miracle. You know what I love about God? He makes a provision for every one of us as long as we are desperate. So let me move on. We get to number three, a dead child, a dead child. In the, in the same time frame <clears throat> that Jesus stopped to heal the desperate woman, the child dies. Can you imagine the pain and the disappointment of the ruler? I'm desperate. I just humbled myself. I just humbled myself before Jesus. I just laid it all down on the ground. The, all my community saw me, and now I did this for nothing because my child is dead. I want you to think like you would think. The ruler's going, um, the whole place saw me spread out before Jesus, and I didn't get a miracle. The child's dead. See, our problem is... If we don't see the answer immediately, then we begin to backstroke and I'm sorry I did that. I shouldn't have gone to the altar because now see things got worse. And we, we even add superstition to our prayer. Uh, I, you know, it, God, listen, we're in a painful world, but God always has a plan for every situation. Jesus had seen the desperate man's cry, and yes, the child died, but when we're believers, we've got to believe that there's glory to God even after death. We don't understand what God is doing, but we trust his plan. Two stories woven together. So what's the significance then? The significance then was that, pardon me, the significance then was that this woman suffered for 12 years. For 12 years, a woman was suffering, that's a long time, you know, suffering with an issue of blood. And this one day, she sees a man throw himself before Jesus, and she reaches and grabs her miracle. What's the significance now added to that? The year the woman started to have her medical problem, a young girl was born that same time. For 12 years, the parents are happy and joyful at this girl. And here she is now. She's, she's 12 years old. She's the pride of her daddy. And at 12, she dies. When the woman received, when the woman got the infliction 12 years ago, the girl was born. When the woman received her miracle, the girl died. Don't you think God has a plan when we don't understand the chaos? God, what are you doing? Twelve years I've been waiting for my miracle and I grabbed it today. And the man's going, twelve years I've been having joy with my daughter and I lost her today. And Jesus is standing in the middle and said, would you trust me? Would you trust me? I know what I'm doing. Something is about to work out in this story. See, the father continued on with Jesus. Jesus said, don't worry, we're going to go home. 
Do you know what the, the, that synagogue ruler is saying? <laughs> well, I've lost it all but Jesus, so I'm going to go with him. Imagine all the other synagogue rulers. They're like, we're going to kick him out. See, he went to that man. I told you that man was. There would have been a lot of chatter, a lot of dial on the channel. And he had to get up off the ground and start walking with Jesus, knowing my child died, my child died, my child died. Meanwhile, the woman's over here going, oh, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. Sometimes we don't understand why God is touching over here and not touching here. But we've got to trust God in the midst of it, that he's got something worked out. When one was born and the other was sick God already had a plan to bring them together and he brought the miracles to together and released them the father continued with Jesus even though it was reported the child had died because he had just observed the miracle of the woman see when you're in your pain and you see another miracle that should give you hope not fear the man was like, you know what? I don't understand why my child died, but this woman just got her miracle. I'm still going to hold on. Parents, you need a stubborn faith that doesn't give up even when it seems impossible. Parents, you need a stubborn faith that does not give up even when it seems impossible. Some of you have given up already, but I want to tell you tonight, Jesus, uh, when he was ready to go to the woman, the, the man's house, Jairus' house, there was a crowd with him. You know what he did? He stop the crowd. You know why he stopped the crowd? Sometimes when you're moving into your miracle, you got to select your people you move with. I'm telling this church right now, I'm expecting God to do the supernatural here, but it doesn't mean I can journey together in, in with, with everyone because sometimes I have to shut a few people out because you can't see it in faith. You won't believe it in faith. Jesus said, I don't want all of you to come with me because some of you are going to come there going, it can't happen. What do you think, Pastor? Do you think, I told you I'm praying God, two millionaires to come in this church. People are like, I, not really, I can't really... You know, what about so-and-so? I don't need you to fix it. I'm just waiting for Jesus to send it. Leave me alone. <laughs> Will I cater to them? I would never cater to money. If they came, they'd be just like everybody else. I just want to see it so we can build up this church and stop having to ask you to put extra in the plate. I want somebody to just write the check so we can do what we need to do and move on. God will do it in Jesus' name. <laughs> but you... Sometimes for your miracle, you can't take everybody with you. You've got to take, Jesus said, just give me these ones that can believe because the others are not going to believe what I'm believing for. I'm about to raise a dead child. Not everybody is going to agree. It says, in fact, the scripture said, they began, the crowd began to laugh. Verse 40, the crowd what? laughed at him. The world is mocking and laughing at us, but I'm believing Pickering Pentecostal Church, we might be amongst the few, but we are going to believe God for a revival that blows the top off. I keep reminding you, there's a casino coming 2020, and they're going to have more lights and fire over there than your eyes can handle. But I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm believing God clean up this house because by next year, we need more fire in this place that will blow their fire out because of what God is doing. They're not going to all pass here and go and gamble their life away. Some of them are going to drop on their knees at the gate and come right in here because we're preaching Holy Ghost. Not everybody should be taken into your miracle work, worship team. Would you come? God of miracles is what I want you to pull. Not everybody. You can't take everybody in. And you can't stand there and study who's watching you. Jairus didn't care who was watching. He said, my child's dead. Are you concerned about the next generation? They're spiritually dead. They're emotionally dead. In fact, some of them are even physically dead. Let me tell you something. Uh, I, I know those of you, how many were down at, 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 in Toronto on Monday? And it's okay, you don't have to be ashamed. Put your hand up for Jesus. Put your hand up, be proud you made it down there. Put it up, put it up, that's all good. In fact, I've, oh, I wish I had worn it. I should have worn it for you to see. I've got my champion hat and my shirt that somebody brought me who works with them. 
So I'll boast it next Sunday. I will don it. But I mean, all of you that were down there, God bless you. You went and celebrated with Kenneth. It was all good. Okay? But the crowd was in a frenzy. There was a unity of spirit. Everything was good. There was positivity. You know what? It's all good. But I want to tell you something that I know was down there too because my sister was down there. She said, girl, I have never smoked weed in my life. But I was, she said, I was high. <laughs> I know. <laughs> all of you, uh, come on, all of you that were down there, you were a little high, weren't you? <laughs> it was in everywhere it was happening because it's so, it's so legal and free right now. Let me tell you, the world will do what the world has to do. So when we get excited in the Holy Ghost, don't you dare pull us down and come go. I need you to be more calm and more, no, 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 no. We want to see miracle signs and wonders happen in the house of the Lord by the blood of the Lamb. In a moment, I'm going to call us, those that are desperate, those that are desperate, I'm going to call you. We're not going to pray over you. You're going to show you, God. you're going to be desperate by yourself. But I want you to sing God of miracles through.